in this lecture, I want to use our very basic um, group theory that we have uh, established so far to derive some really nice theorems in number theory. Let me recall from last time, uh, let G be a group and H be a subgroup. Then we considered the left cosets And we prove that they are partition the set G. In other words, these sets where G varies over G form a partition of G. Now the corresponding equivalence relation Every partition um, defines a unique equivalence relation and vice versa. The associated equivalence relation is just given by, well, G is uh, equivalent to K. We define that to be true if and only if K minus 1 G is an element of H. But remember, this of course is also true if and only if uh, G H is actually equal to K H. And the equivalence classes, what are the equivalence classes? Well, the equivalence classes are of course given by G, well denoted by G bar, and they're just these cosets G H. And uh, uh, further no more, of course, we note that H bar, which is H H, is of course equal to H if H is in H. Now, uh, this whole lecture really is about a special group a G equal to Z. So let, let me say that. So now we let uh, G equal to B C additive group Z with zero as the identity and plus as our um, binary operation. And we let H to be the group generated by N, where N is a natural number. And this group, of course, we can think of it as just the multiples of Z by N. So now we can uh, look at the left cosets. The left cosets um, of, N, well, they're NZ, we can denote that as N bar. But then we have also 1 plus NZ, which is 1 bar, and so on, all the way up to N minus 1 plus NZ, N minus 1 bar is another notation. And of course, N. We can also think of it, of course, as zero bar. That's the same notation. So we see that um, in this case, x is related to y if and only if x minus y is an element in n times z. And that, of course, is just the same to say that x plus nz is equal to y plus nz and that is the same as saying that x bar is really the set of all elements, well, it's a coset x plus n z. So we have really here this very nice interpretation of and um, of these left cosets. So let me summarize the set of left cosets. is the group G mod H, or in other, our case, Z mod NZ, which is the set 0 bar, 1 bar, all the way up to N minus 1 bar. 
Now, uh, I just make you a note. Um, you might wonder why do we look at the left code sets and not the right code sets. Um, but of course, as our group, Z is a billion. Uh, the left code sets and right code sets. Agree. Okay, so um, now in modular arithmetic, what we want to do is uh, we want to add, be able to add these elements, but even also uh, multiply them. So we make a definition for x bar and y bar elements in z mod n z, we define x bar plus y bar to be equal to x plus y and then taking its coset. And similarly, we can define x bar y bar to be another coset, namely the coset that we have. Uh, given by x times y. Now, uh, it's not so clear that this makes sense. And indeed, there's a proposition that these operations are well defined. Well, I should really explain what I mean by well-defined, or why should um, why is there even a question? Let's just look at an example. Let's take n equal to seven, and say x is equal to one bar. But of course, that is also equal to twenty-two bar in modular seven arithmetic. And uh, my my take y to be equal to three bar, which is the same as thirty eight bar. So in other words, my x and my y bar, they effectively have more than one name, and depending on what name I choose, namely if I want to compute now x bar plus y bar. That, of course, is 1 plus 3 bar, which by our definition is equal to 4 bar. But on the other hand, I could also compute x bar plus y bar to be equal to 22 bar plus 38 bar, which, of course, is 22 plus 38 bar which is equal to, well, um, what is that? That's 60 bar. And hence, this is the same as 56 plus 4 bar or equal to 4 bar. So indeed, it doesn't, it didn't matter which um, name effectively I use. And uh, I get the same result. And this is something that we need to check both for the addition and the multiplication in modular arithmetic. So let me uh, provide that proof for you. So let's assume we have x bar is equal to x dash bar and also y bar is equal to y dash bar. Then, because they are in the same coset, that of course means that x has to be equal to x bar plus some multiple of n. Let's call it k n. And similarly, I must be able to write y as y dash plus a multiple by n, let's say L.
So now we can prove the independence, namely x bar plus y bar is equal to, by definition, x plus y bar. Writing this in terms of cosets, this is x plus y n times z. Now I um, take my equations here and here and replace x by x dash plus kn and y dash plus ln. But now I can see this part and this part are completely absorbed by the nz. And I see that x dash plus y dash is, in, um, is the same as this. But then uh, reading this backwards, this is just uh, our coset for x dash y dash. And reading our definition backwards, this is by definition the addition of the cosets x dash and y dash. Similarly, we can uh, do the multiplication. So here we have x y times x. <coughs> Now again, this is a, a y plus nz, and using our equations up there, uh, let me just write it out. And remembering that I can absorb any multiples of n into this um, factor here in the set there. I see that this is just x dash y dash plus n z. And so this is indeed x dash y dash bar, which by definition was x dash times y dash bar. So we have um, proven that merely our addition and multiplication is well defined. So proposition z mod n z with our zero and addition is an abelian group isomorphic to the to a cyclic group of order n. And indeed, uh, z mod nz is generated by the element 1 bar, which has order n. This is really summarizing uh, what we have. Um, another proposition is that multiplication on our set z mod n z is associative commutative and distributive well and i should uh, maybe say um with identity one bar. Well, really, there's not much to prove here because all the properties are really inherited. So let me just write this out. These properties are inherited from the integers. Indeed, for x bar, y bar, z bar in our group z mod nz, what we have, just to check distributivity, 
if I take x bar times y bar plus z bar, then uh, this, of course, um, is the same as x bar. And now first doing y plus z bar. And then multiplying, so this is indeed x times y plus z bar, each time using the definition of our addition and multiplication. Uh, but now I can, of course, multiply uh, things inside. I use the distributivity in z, and this is just xz, and then taking bar. And so this uh, turns out to be xy bar plus xz bar, uh, and that in turn is x bar y bar plus x bar z bar, which is precisely what I wanted to show. And similarly, we can do, of course, now um, associativity. Where we need to prove this identity. I leave that to you. And of course, commutativity in a very similar way. I leave that to you to fill out the dots. Okay, so we have this really nice um, a group and we have actually a multiplication on uh, these elements. So let me write the proposition. A. Let x, z be an element in z mod n, z. Then x bar has a multiplicative inverse x bar minus 1 if and only if the highest common factor of x and n is 1. In other words, at x and n have to be co-prime. And secondly, uh, if we just look at the set of units, which we denote by uh, x and z and then star, so these are all the elements and that are invertible under the multiplication, this is an abelian group. So let's prove this. Right. Let's start with um, x and n having highest common factor equal to 1. This implies by Vesu's lemma that um, I can write 1 as a linear combination of x and n. But now uh, this means that uh, if I just look at a bar x bar, that differ uh, since a and x differ from 1 by a multiple of n, this must be just equal to 1 bar. And therefore we have seen that uh, uh, the inverse is just given by a bar. Vice versa. Assume we have an inverse. Of x bar. Then of course a bar x bar is equal to 1 bar and this implies that a x plus a multiple of n is equal to 1.
But if we have that, then uh, what do we see? Yeah, if I change A and B, what do I have here on the right hand, uh, the left hand side? I just have all the linear combinations in X and N. So this is the subgroup generated by X and N. And on the right hand side, I have one and its subgroup. But uh, this immediately in, now implies that the highest common factor of x and n is equal to 1 because we have seen before that the subgroup generated by x and n, this is a subgroup of z and therefore itself has to be cyclic and hence generated by one element. And we proved before that this is generated by the highest common factor of x and n. What about the second part? That's quite uh, straightforward. Uh, we just check our group um, axioms. We have a unit, namely 1. And so in particular, z mod nz star is non-empty. Second condition, well if x bar and y bar are units, then so is x bar y bar. Indeed, uh, what we have, the highest common factor of x and um, n is equal to 1. And the highest common factor of y and n is equal to 1. And this implies, of course, that the highest common factor of x times y and n is still equal to 1. All right, and finally, uh, what about inverses? Uh, well, if x bar is a unit with inverse x bar minus 1, then also x bar minus 1 is a unit with inverse, of course, um, given by x bar. So uh, indeed, these units in uh, z mod n, z form an, a group. Why is it abelian? Of course, uh, we have already seen that the multiplication is commutative. Right, so as a corollary, when we look at z mod pz, then I claim this is a field. And we claim this is a field if and only if p is a prime. Well, there's not much to prove. Um, we note that the units this time around, of course, everything is um, co prime to P apart from zero. Uh, so the units here are actually just a set Z mod PZ without the zero. And this forms an abelian group, and that's really all what um, we need to say uh, because now all the field axioms are satisfied.
I should uh, show the inverse, converse. So if we assume that n is actually a composite, so let's say p times q for some integers uh, p greater than 1 and q greater than 1, then of course p bar is not uh, equal to 0 bar and q bar is not equal to 0 bar but their product p bar times q bar is equal to n bar which is the same as 0 bar in z mod n z and in, in particular so in particular p bar and q bar do not have inverses and hence that mod nz is not a field. Okay, so this is very uh, useful information and uh, now I'm uh, more or less ready. Maybe I uh, first give a couple of examples uh, of what sort of groups can um, arise. Let's uh, look at the group Z mod 12Z and its units. Well, what are the units? Well, of course, one is a unit, and two is not a unit because it's not a co-prime. Three does not, is not co-prime. Four is not co-prime. So the next co-prime number is five. And then we have seven and eleven. And these are all the um, numbers co-prime to twelve. Now, um, what is the multiplication here? Well, uh, one bar, of course, is equal to, uh, well, it's squared, is equal to one, so it has order one. Uh, five bar times five bar is equal to 25 bar, and this is equal to one bar, so it has order two. Seven times seven is 49 bar, and um, modulo 12, uh, again, this is 1, and finally 11, 11 is equal to 121, equal to 1 bar. So uh, we know the uh, groups of order 4, and we see that this particular group of order 4 that we find ourselves here, um, working with here is actually the um, group V4, the Klein group, or we have seen this is also just the cyclic group of order 2 times itself. What about um, another example, namely Z mod 5? Z. Now, S. 5 is prime, we actually get a 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're all units. And in this case, it's not uh, too difficult to see. Uh, well, uh, let's just see what happens when we multiply. This is equal to 4. And if we look at 2 times 2 times 2, then this is equal to 8 bar, which is equal to 3 bar. And finally, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is equal to 16 bar, which is equal to 1 mod 5. So, uh, indeed, we see that um, in this case, we have an element of order 4. And so... Uh, we are dealing with a cyclic group, cyclic group of order four. So here's the definition. 
a very important function in number theory, uh, the Euler function, Euler phi function, I, n, phi of n, we define this to be the order, this size of z mod nz, well, the units in, the number of units in z mod nz. So, for example, uh, clearly, if uh, we're dealing with a prime, p, then phi of p is just equal to p minus 1. All the elements apart from 0 are co-prime. Similarly, if we look at uh, p to the uh, k, well, then we're asking, you know, if you just string up uh, the uh, numbers from starting with 0, 1, 2, up to um, uh, p to the k minus 1, you ask yourself how many of these elements are not co-prime. Well, every so often, the first one, then uh, p times later, I get another one, and p later, and so on. So it really is uh, all the elements are co-prime apart from uh, p, k, minus 1, many of them. And similarly, we can, so this is also for uh, p uh, prime. And similarly, there's another nice formula that if I have m and n, and I know that m and n are co-prime, so the highest common factor of m and n is 1, then these phi values actually just multiply. And again, it's just a counting argument. I leave that to you. It's not too difficult. So with this, uh, we have a Fermat's little here. It says that if p is prime, x is an element in z, and p does not divide x, so in other words, they are co-prime, then x to the p minus 1 is equal to 1 mod p. So I've written it as a number theoretic identity. So let's prove this. So we are given that the highest common factor of p and x is equal to 1. And therefore, we know that x bar is actually an element in our group of units. And therefore, it follows that uh, x bar to the order of our group, p minus 1, must be equal to the identity. So this is, let me spell it out, this is because the size of z mod pz, units of it, is equal to p minus 1. We just computed that. And because for any element g in some group g, capital G, if I raise it to the power of that, um, to the order of the group g, then this always will give me the identity for any group g. So in particular for this uh, group, and uh, so uh, what do we see? We see immediately that x to the p minus 1 is equivalent to 1 mod p. So let me now derive the second number theoretic theorem, namely Euler's theorem. If n is greater or equal to 2, x is an element in z, 
and the highest common factor of n and x is 1, then we have that x to the raised to the Euler number of n is equivalent to 1 mod n. So let me actually, for emphasis, put these errors in there. So it's really uh, one step further from uh, Fermat's little theorem, namely in the case when uh, we are dealing with a known prime. So the proof is very similar because we have that in the highest common factor of n and x is equal to 1. This implies that x bar is actually a unit in z mod nz. And therefore, x bar raised to the number phi n is equal to 1 bar by the same reason, namely as the size of z mod nz, the units they're in, is equal to phi of n by definition. And once again, because raising any element in a group to the power of the group gives the identity. And so we are done, namely this now just means that x to the phi n is equivalent to 1 mod n. So this now leads us to the uh, third and last theorem, namely Wilson's theorem. Assume P is prime, then I want to conclude that P minus 1 factorial is equivalent to minus 1 mod p. Let's prove this. Now when p is equal to 2, the left hand side gives us 1 and the right hand side is minus 1, but mod 2 they are indeed the same, so this checks out. Otherwise we can assume now that p is equal to 3 or larger. Now, um, p minus 1 factorial is, of course, uh, nothing else but 1 times 2 times 3, all the way up to p minus 1. And the claim is that up to a, a multiple of n, this is equal to minus 1. So I really want to uh, now think about uh, these as elements in my group z mod p z and their units. <clears throat> now uh, in any uh, group um, when I have a product of these elements I can of course um, pair find the pairs x and x minus 1 and if they're different then they cancel in the product. Now, if they are, so I don't really have to worry about them. So on the other hand, what about if I get singletons? Well, singletons, of course, I get singletons if x um, bar, so let me look at these bars, is equal to x bar minus 1. 
But that's going to be true if and only if x bar squared is the same as 1 bar. Or in other words, x bar squared minus 1 bar is 0. Or indeed, x minus 1 bar times x plus 1 bar is equal to 0 bar. And we see clearly that this happens that only if x minus 1 bar or is equal to 0 or x plus 1 bar is equal to 0. Now this happens exactly once, namely when x is equal to 1. And this also happens exactly once, namely when x is equal to minus 1. Or in other words, p minus 1 bar. And so um, we now conclude that apart from the 1 and the p minus 1, all others um, multiply and cancel each other. And we are left with uh, p minus 1. So our p minus 1 factorial bar is just equal to p minus 1 bar which is equal to minus, minus 1 bar. Or, in other words, that just means that p minus 1 factorial is the same as minus 1 mod p. And this is Wilson's set. I hope this was quite fun to see group theory actually used in a number theory. And I wish you a good break.